think you got it located down in Tampa Bay. Yeah. You look fine. Right. Yeah, you look fine. I can tell. I have the you want one dry? Yeah. Oh, that's I think good. Uh, soaked in water. Well, what you need to do is just step outside. <laughs> because I know I was getting hot in my room. I actually turned on the air conditioning in my room. I because did, right after the shower, too. Yeah. One button. I usually do, but just one. I usually do. You could be a hipster with all of them up there, but you know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Run the show. Yeah. Just run the show. F10 or something like that. Woo! Okay. Ready, everything's queued. We have no audio, but I don't need audio. We need audio from here. Huh? Audio captured oh, from here. Sure. No, I mean audio from no, there's no video, is there? I know. They had to give me audio. I know. <laughs> um, you good on the ROA? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's I can do that without the vapor. Yeah. But well, uh, just in case I've got the relevant slide pull up if you give me credit. So I'm good. Thank I'm you. good. <laughs> oh. We're good. Oh, are we? I don't know. Are we good? Actually, that's our first slide. <laughs> well, we're introducing ourselves. They know who we are. Well, yeah, that's all. After all that, and I got it all tucked in your thing, and you just throw it. Yeah, you w no, <laughs> you're, you're good. You're good. Okay. All right, we're going to self introduce. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Scott Menner. Uh, I got Frank and Matt here. Uh, our presentation today is something that we've actually started and submitted to. Uh, probably, well, last December when we put it in uh, for, you know, consideration. And what we've been doing is, is over a five-year uh, five process of how we collect data or why we started collecting data, uh, you know, all the different resources. And uh, our operation is pretty much self-contained, okay? Uh, it's pretty much, they don't bug us, you know, when I first got to UNLV, and the first thing, even in one of my questions, you know, when I was going through the hiring process was, what type of data can you collect? And nobody could give me an answer of, you know, okay, well, I want to know, you know, how much usage of the classrooms, what type of technology and stuff like that. We were just kind of all on our own. So, you know, I just worked on building the department and getting in our service levels up and things like that. Uh, First of all, uh, myself, I'm the manager of Classroom Technology Services. Frank is uh, our system design specialist. Uh, we have a, a Crestron programmer. Uh, and our secondary programmer over here, uh, who is a IT Technician 6 slash programmer. Uh, and then we have a computer person. And that's pretty much our whole department. Uh, next slide. And a uh, little bit of about the campus background, uh, we have like 
270 general purpose classrooms. Departmental space is currently is sitting at 217. These numbers change constantly. Uh, and you know, another initiative that we're in charge of was the digital signage. You know, over the past, when I first got there, there was like two displays, one player. Now we're up to you know 55 displays, over 22 different departments running on two different servers, a Visix from there. Uh, Right now, we just want to go into uh, ask you all a few questions, okay? And uh, actually, I'm sorry, we're going to ask you to present to us of what you're doing. But just a quick discussion is, you know, what are your data needs? What are you, are you collecting data? You know, are you some people collecting? I don't know, what is required for you to collect the data? Why are you collecting the data? Does anybody have any kind of notion of, do y'all collect data at all? Okay, all right. Do you know why you're collecting that data, other than being a requirement? <laughs> Is it a requirement? We make it one. Hey. <laughs> uh, we collect data, but we were trying to do it across a myriad of academic systems. So we were using mostly just uh, some things that we could compare across <laughs> a lot of different platforms. Mm -hmm. So that was our first goal was like how many users, like numbers that you can compare from one platform to the next platform to the next platform, regardless of use case. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're going to be getting into more um, individual platform kind of consumption rate data. Right is what we're going to be diving into next. So our first goal was to sort of abstract, mm. which was kind of hard because yeah. obviously all platforms don't do the same thing. Yeah, our bosses asked us, what's the cost per use comparison across all these different platforms? And we were like, ah. <laughs> yeah, because we're trying to figure out like uh, success of the service, basically. How, yeah. how successful is the service? How right. many people use, actually use it? You know, is the return on our investment, does it look mm -hmm. good? You know, things yep. like that. Adoption rates, like how fast are they being adopted? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to be going through that with lecture capture. We just finished an RFP on lecture capture, so we're going to actually right now thinking about metrics and things like that. And, you know, I hope they. I'm not in charge of it, but I'm part of it because we're the technology in the classrooms. But the actual uh, deployment is is actually another uh, group within our bigger organization. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a good time to be able to look at actually starting up front. Okay, five years ago, we weren't required to collect any data or anything like that. And, and it came to a point to where, you know, they asked us, they start, they gave us some money. Okay, and they said, well, you got all these classrooms, how do you want to do it? Well, we, we uh, Frank will be going through a matrix of what we did to select the classroom. That was the first things we did uh, five years ago. The process is, was first, you know, identifying goals, even though a lot of these things came in our developing our data collection, okay? Uh, data collection, well, the reason why we're collecting, it gives us a, a real insight of where we're going and what we need. Uh, you know, we can show the, you know, track repairs, we can do uh, age of equipment, we can lobby for more funding, you know, or what we normally do is kind of like, okay, you give us this money, okay, here's a paper to show you exactly how it's used, and we're very good stewards of your money, okay, now really important, at least to us, you know, we, we kept everything above board, okay. <laughs> Uh, then, you, you know, we collected the data, which uh, we're going to go through a few resources, how we're collecting our data, where we got it from. You know, we didn't have any kind of like uh, official data warehouse that we can run queries on and everything else like that. Well, we're just worried about the AV department and AV equipment, so, uh, and what we put forward. Uh, then we kind of analyze the data and look at trends, and then we presented the data. And the two things that we really tried to look for is easily interpreted by non-technical folks. 
Okay. It, it may sense that it's second nature to y'all, but, uh, uh, and displaying the data in a valuable manner, you know, through graphs or things like that, something that's easy to read and something that's easy to understand. So, you know, when we do our data collection and everything, everybody in the department is part of that. It's not one person that's my job is to collect data. Well, you do programming, uh, you do programming on Fusion, we get data from that. Uh, we have student workers, you know, that have my UNLV. They can check all the instructors and course sections and capacities and students, uh, the students, not really students data, but kind of like how many students are in one class, you know, in one section, and that's in one of our classrooms. And we're interoperating all that data so we can get some meaningful uh, understanding. Okay, next. All right, I'm gonna give this over to Frank here real quick. Hi everybody, I'm Frank. Uh, I'm gonna tell you how I got the numbers. So, <laughs> right off the bat before we're doing any sort of data collection, right? Before, like Scott was saying, we need to know why we're doing the data. Well, before we do any of that, the most important thing is you gotta make sure the stuff that you have in place can actually produce the data. What I mean by that is if you don't have Crestron Fusion, Crestron Global Reviewer, any sort of thing that you use within your control systems to have your classrooms talk back to you to tell you what they're doing, you're failing right there. You need to have something that's robust enough to do that. Also, you need projectors, your flat panels, your computers, your, your processors, whatever it is, they all need to be able to talk and report back numbers. Sometimes that doesn't happen out of the box. Luckily, we have a programmer that writes most of our own code, reaches out to manufacturers, a lot of manufacturers reach out to us. Hitachi, for instance, they're our projector manufacturer. We needed to get, my guy was so granular, he wanted to get down to find out the room temperature that the fan take, the intake was going in and the lamp temperature around the projector lamp. They didn't report that. They wrote a custom code, sent it back to us. Now, in Fusion, we get that. So if there's anything that you need obscurely to report back with your data, reach out to your manufacturers. Most of the time they will help you out and they will give you some of that information that's not general public knowledge and they'll help you because it's helping them. And then they might put it into their next firmware update or whatever. On top of your equipment itself, you got your resources. So Fusion, for example, I just talked about that. Um, the time, the date, and the auto shut off, the source utilization, et cetera, et cetera, those are all attributes. Um, we can go into a whole Crestron Fusion thing for a million hours in this place. We've been doing it for years. <laughs> I'm gonna blow over that. Um, 25 lives, Scott was saying earlier about our class sec sections and utilizations. So whatever your registrar uses on your campus, we use 25 lives. So whatever you folks are using, make sure you can get in touch with your registrar and your registrar allows you to get that information. So we were siloed. We weren't allowed to do that. At one time, we just didn't even know how to do that. So Within Fusion, we were able to get a URL from our registrar, pop it in the Fusion, and now we know when we go into our Fusion monitoring system, we see a classroom, hit schedule, we see every class that's listed in there, every instructor that's listed in there, and it all reports back live. So when we get to this part here with the footprints, that's our ticketing information system, that also ties in. We can put in a ticket for the instructor information is already all built in. So if they were to call us in a panic Quick, get over to my room and they hang the phone up. We don't know who it was, we don't know where they're at. That's all right there in that information. We log our ticket. So it's basically a little safeguard on us for later for more tracking because we can then reach out to that instructor directly and contact him after his class and say, how did it go after we fixed your thing? Did it happen again? Blah, blah, blah. So that's a, a good little part about tying in uh, our my UNLV. Um, I talked about the manufacturer specifications earlier. That was kind of up top. Uh, the RMS, the cost per kilowatt hour. That was something we worked on for our return on investment about whether we were doing uh, lamp projectors or lampless projectors, whether we were having rooms turn on and rooms turn off on their own, whether we were using the occupancy sensors or not using them or whatever. So we actually contacted Nevada Energy and found out what we were paying as a university for our kilowatt hour. And Scott will talk about it later. He has a whole breakdown about that kind of stuff. So we tie that in. 
and then defining how to store and retrieve your data. So for us, we have an end of year report. Um, you guys might do annual reports, you might do monthly reports, you might have to turn your information into, if, if it's coming from the top down and they're asking for it, they might be on their schedule. This is our schedule, so no one's asking us for our information, we're volunteering our information. So we did this, on, we took it upon ourselves to do it, started to volunteer it, and then it started to gain traction. Then they're saying, wow, this can really do this. We didn't know you were doing this, et cetera, et cetera. So we do that and then we turn it into our life cycle document. Scott was saying earlier that we, this kind of just evolved. It, it's a, it, 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 it did exactly that, it's a giant organism. So when we started building our inventory as we were doing our installations, we started to find more things out and more things out and it turned into our life cycle plan, which, uh, Matt, next slide, which should get into this. Bunch of numbers. So 2012 and 2013 were what we call regular average years on our campus. So we, yeah, so we had um, 33 and 38, a little bit of money here, and this is our, so we got our departmental spaces, we got our general purpose spaces. So those first two years, don't be fooled by these big numbers. Those numbers there were just, I might have had money for 20 projectors, we might have just changed projectors only. So in 20 rooms, that number just went up from, you know, they're not full system rebuilds. Those were down here. So those two there were the rooms we might have changed PCs in, we might have changed projectors, we might have added a camera, whatever. And this, as you can see, the number's not very big, and it was only, they were ongoing for the year. It wasn't like one rollout project. So these were projects that we started to get money, and every now and then a department would call us with these over here, and they'd say, hey, we want to do this for a room, and we would go and do it. So we managed that much money on those department ones and these general purpose ones. Here's where it gets interesting. 2014 to 18, numbers in black here, that's where we got the five-year plan where Scott was talking about where we started to roll out some money. So the university started to get what they call capital improvement money. So they had sal salary savings across the university and in Enchi, Nevada State Higher Ed, the whole group. So the school itself, UNLV, would give us, say, $100,000 toward our classroom upgrade. Then they would contact the COPP folks and they would get another $600,000 from state money, but it had to go to classroom use only. Could not go to conference rooms, couldn't go to departments. It had to go general purpose, classroom only, had to benefit the whole, right? So first year they hit us with $1.5 million. We went, wow, oh, what are we going to do? We never had to do this before. We got to get this done over three months of the summer, we got to take down classrooms. It was a nightmare. First year, we didn't know what to do. And, and we learned on our own. We had to cancel classes, contact the registrar, order equipment, put out a bid, all that stuff, right? The next year, a little less money, a little less, a little less, a little less. And I'm gonna get to a spreadsheet and explain why it went to that after. So the first year, we did 48 rooms, so we hit it hard. And then the next year, they gave us a little less money because the gentleman who was handing out the money, so to speak, he asked us, how much money do you think you're going to need next year and the year after and the year after? We'll get to that spreadsheet and I'll show you that. And that's why the number here is a little bit more even versus the big one that they hit us with here. Departmental spaces, that is strictly depending on if department has money. Grant money, uh, donation money, whatever. So that number there, those are just nice to look at. These are our general purpose rooms here. This is our bread and butter. There's a lot more similarities in the years and projects with money here. Keep in mind that, sec that second slide we showed you, 170 general purpose classrooms, this side. 317 total, all of this en encompassing the departmental and ours, which are all reporting data. So everything that we have into Fusion, that's all reporting data. We're, just, we're not just getting our general purpose stuff. We're learning stuff about the department folks as well. Like you spoke about earlier yesterday on our tour with you, <laughs> so, so Ron was saying the same thing. He had to blend his departments with his group. It took him a long time to do that. Well, now we have a service level agreement with our departments, and we're doing the same thing. And we're tracking all of their information. So in five years, we can contact them and say, this projector's out of warranty. You might want to think about replacing it. This one will have a life cycle. We'll know when our five years up. But they don't always have the money in five years. So we'll try and prolong that by monitoring infusion and doing room shutdowns and getting the projector to live a little bit longer just outside that warranty, which we don't like to really do. Um, Matt, could you jump to the spreadsheet? All right, you know what, get, go back to that for the, slide, the next slide. Go to the next slide. This information here is gonna be on the spreadsheet we're gonna show you in a second. And this is how we got to those 30 rooms that the gentleman was asking us about, what rooms are you doing next year? 
We used this metric to figure this out. So what we did is we took the capacity of how many seats the room has, so say 50 seats in here, right? We took the hours per week, fiscal, or this was a fall of 2017, how many hours the room occupancy was used for the semester. So we base it basic on 14 hour day, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. That is generally where our classes are. And then we look at how many students were in there for each one of those classes. We would go back to the previous year, find out how many, if there was 26 registered in this class and 25 in this one, we would add all that up, come up with this number of the maximum students impacted. Now go to spreadsheet, buddy. So, scroll right there. So here's our room. So for instance, we got regular classrooms. Our capacity is how many seats are in there. There's the hours. There's our class period, our utilization. I mean, this was, this took a long time for our programmer to figure this out. And he broke it down into how much, um, right down to how many hours and how many students if you added up all those classes. I mean, we knew everything that was in there. And he's got what Matt's showing you now. These are our larger classrooms. These are our medium-sized classrooms. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, we have our smaller classrooms down here below. So we broke it down into rooms that only had 16 seats, 18 seats, 30 seats. And as you see, that number is a lot smaller, 800, 900 versus the 4,000 and 5,000 up there. So going back to that list and all those five years and how we did this, we hit those targeted rooms where we were used more impact. That's when we hit the 750,000. And then the next year, uh, jump to remaining rooms tab. So this is our last tab. This is going on this summer. Neat little colors, huh? So um, we got onto this one. This is this summer. And this is going to close out our five year. So if you notice, these are the smaller rooms with a lot less capacity and a lot less students that we had in the first four years. So we targeted the heavy use rooms and we slowly worked our way down to the lower use rooms. And the goal in that whole thing was to do two things. One, get the whole campus on a replacement cycle of like-minded equipment. So we didn't have analog equipment and data, digital equipment and this projector model and that projector model. Everything now has the same family spread over five years, model changes here and there, but manufacturer, we kept the same, right? So we get all of our information. This is the last year for our project. And now what? So now we got to figure out, we don't have any more money coming in. The school's not giving us that 750,000 every more year. Now we're into life cycle replacements. Now we go back to university and say, we need this, mon mon this much money to make this campus keep running. And that's where Scott's going to jump in here and talk about the life cycle. One of the th things that's really kind of neat when you when you're able to thirty rooms each year uh, each time, we actually set up a spreadsheet. Okay, with the room number. Uh, you know, what equipment's in there, the model, everything. But they actually went farther than that. We have the firmware update on each piece of equipment. We have the IP addresses. We have the MAC addresses. We have, uh, you know, color if it's necessary. But we collected all the intricate data on every piece of equipment that we installed over the five years. And it kept on building and building. And then, like, like you said, you know, we're fortunate to have this type of funding over these years. But uh, we actually had this long spreadsheet, okay. And I said, wow, it's got the today's date. I can put that in there and I can win when we purchase it. Okay, well, let's put another life cycle column in there and then look at, all right, this year is 2018. Well, we can find out exactly what we need to replace in 2018 based on that life cycle, you know, that we put in there. Normally our life cycles goes one year outside of manufacturer warranty. Like Crestron will go six years, you know, it's a five year warranty on it. Or the uh, projectors are four year warranties on there and we will push them to five years, you know. Oh, they're five year warranty. Well, we try not to go past five years. <laughs> but we still got some other older projectors that were still changing and things like that that still have three and four years. But uh, the new ones we're buying now are ha do have a five years warranty. So, uh, so we took a, a so if you want to just go to the spreadsheet. This is kind of the spreadsheet that we're talking about. And if you can kind of, uh, what well we took that inventory one 
and I pretty much all the technical data and everything that was in there, I kind of like disregarded that. But once I got at this, and we found out, well, you know, it's just a sort the columns type thing in, in you know, in Excel. And so let's see how many, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, let's go by projector. And that's all. And then you can actually uh, clear the install date and go to the replacement date. Yeah, so like this is what's in 2018. We already updated the spreadsheet for what we're putting in. So we had a up-to-date, accurate spreadsheet of every classroom that we service. So this was something like a little byproduct. Okay, now I got life cycles. I can tell anybody asks me at any time, what do you want to do? The first thing I'm going to do is going to go to this sheet, just do my uh, columns of what pieces of gear. And I can sort it by, you know, room, room type, uh, uh, the model of projector, uh, but it, it, we have a shared drive between everybody. Anybody works on anything, pieces of equipment change or anything, we do go to that shared drive just to make sure that's updated for us. But making your whole crew see the value of this really prompts them to, you know, put their input, keep it updated, and keep it moving on. And we've got a few couple anal people like, oh, yeah, let's have it just, just right, you know. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. This is another thing was when he was talking about our footprints, BMS footprints, our ticketing system for actually all of OIT and other departments. And this is something that we kind of put together. I, and we, we collect everything on all the service calls, okay. When we're looking at the data, okay, and the categories, when they're setting up the footprints thing, they ask our department, well, you know, okay, classroom technology, you know, we can sort the service calls for you if you got a problem with the projector, if you got a training problem, you got a thing. So we gave them a whole bunch of categories. We gave them, you know, computer peripherals to monitor to uh, the actual CPU to every little piece of equipment in there that may have broken audio systems, microphones, stuff like that. Well, at that time, we were a little bit too granular. Uh, I really don't care if a mouse you know, because the mouse breaks, we replace it and stuff like that. I don't think that, but it, it is a computer problem. So we started combining categories, and they just went to a new release of Footprints 12, this thing. And we got to redo all our categories. So we really thought about them and to make proper categories of what do we want to collect the data on and to where we can run reports out of there and get all the information. Uh, as you can see, and another thing, it's a quick glance of, what you can do with it. Actually, this is from fiscal year 12, 13 to the fiscal year 14, yeah, three years. And you can see some of the attributes going down, but at the same level are staying the same. But at the same time, we're increasing the number of rooms with new technology. Uh, technology. Uh, even though you don't see anything going down, we have a, ho uh, a larger workload. So it shouldn't. So we have to, you know, clarify it, you know, uh, increased number of new instructors unfamiliar with technology that's going to make our, uh, our training category go up, uh, increased age of equipment on the original systems before we went to uh, the new all digital systems, and increased support for department learning spaces. When I got there, it was kind of like departments were on their own. <laughs> pretty much, or they got, or they got a guy. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we'll just call that guy. Yeah, uh, but actually, we started when Frank and everything. We started really building our uh, 
our rapport with Pine and Construction. Okay, and to where Pine and Construction loves us. Is the reason is not that we're real great guys, is that we take so much work off of their plate. Okay, we'll do the bidding, we'll do the uh, uh, design, the, the line drawing, everything involved in the bid and the procurement process for uh, Pine and Construction, who their client is, the department. Okay. We'll meet directly with the department. We'll get everything together. We'll identify their needs. We'll put every, the whole package together and help them through the process. Uh, well, the thing was, we were building all these rooms. And when I got there, they were pretty much on our own. But we were so involved in the construction of the room or in the technology that we had to take, uh, had to support them. I mean, it was a no-brainer. So. And it, it was kind of like, my old boss was kind of like, go to a boy system. He's like, oh, yeah, my friend's over there. Yeah, you just take a look at his stuff over there. Well, you just kind of flatten that out and just say, we serviced everything. Okay. <laughs> department, departmental rooms, the only thing that we don't do with departmental rooms is we don't have the staff to do the preventive maintenance. Okay. And we will not pay for their equipment. So if a lamp goes out and stuff like that, we'll go over there and change it, no problem, come back, and we'll actually charge the department for the lamp. And that's pretty much all we can do as far as cost recovery. But it does even, even the playing fields, and it gives us a rapport with all the departments to where let's just go to them first. You know, it was such an easy process the last time. So we're doing a lot of working with departments and uh, building those rapports and relationships actually that I'm getting a little bit off. Okay. <laughs> One other thing that we do with our service calls. Okay. And the first two weeks of class, you'd think that's, you know, that's the time that you're going to be running around, you know, and uh, everything. So we started looking after the two weeks of class, we make sure, you know, spreadsheet, every service call that we do, just for those two weeks. Well, we record all of them, but after two weeks, we, we break these down, and as a department, that Friday, we'll have pizza or something like that, and we'll go over all the numbers. Or, and we'll, we'll determine every single call of what could have been preventable and what was just a break fix, you know? Well, what we do is we, we kind of sit down with the whole group and everything, and we say, uh, could have this been prevented or not prevented? We're not looking to look at, oh, okay, you checked that room and it was broken. Okay. Uh, we don't play that way. But we, <laughs> we play like, oh, great. Now let's make a note of it and the training or our next semester uh, will actually make sure that is done for that particular room or or if it was missed or whatever. I mean, some things you can't really, I mean, imaging computers, we've got DPREs and everything else like that. We, we push an image and stuff like that. It seems to work fine. I don't know if you ever had that, and all of a sudden you get a little glitch in your image. <laughs> uh, going back to that other spreadsheet, you'll see one year that kind of spiked up on computers <laughs> because we had a little glitch in our image that we had to go back and do that. But we're, we're constantly reviewing. Uh, and this is actually the spreadsheet that do, that we use is kind of like, what could it? Uh, is the green one for the ones that could have been prevented? Or the pink ones are the fundamental ones that we don't have access to the ones that we've got gray ones? Or is there like you guys are in, you guys get the same review with the plan? Because these are called official notes that we still log in to the rest of our club. The green ones here are ones that we did not see coming. So this one here, the projector, for some reason, had to be power cycled. And it was up to two of the clouds to jump on for that cavity. And then the ones down here in the black, these are all like your eye clicker, power plunge, training, software. These are all items that... Regular <coughs> service items, yeah. Instructors, they just get up, you know, have their stuff in a row. Mm -hmm. We log that stuff, but nothing in the classroom was detrimental to not having class. Everything in the classroom functioned. These are just ancillary problems that we had to deal with. And then we have another category of transfer calls. We have a placard on all of our restrooms. We have a phone on all of our restrooms. Our number's on the restroom. If the lights don't work, they're calling us. If the heat doesn't work, they're calling us. If the air conditioner works, they're calling us. So we train.
transfer a lot faster. So that is the majority of our call. But in the two week span, I think we had maybe a hundred and some calls come through, and we've got the next forty to do it with the download button. So each year that number has gone down, 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 down. And because each time we incorporate everything we learned in the previous semester and just kind of just add it to our training. Uh, the way we check rooms is our preventive maintenance is, uh, you know, begin be two weeks before every semester we go through every room. The reason we don't go through department rooms is access because uh, we're general and they kind of keep type on a lot of their labs and things like that and some are hard key and not access cards and things like that. So, uh, but we'll be working with them. Um, I could actually do the same. Okay, <coughs> uh, my name is Matt Brogdon, as you guys have seen in the introduction. Um, so we have three auto shutdown algorithms or scenarios, if you will, built into our control system programming. And these allow for shutdowns of the systems preemptively during periods of presumed dormancy or inactivity. And basically these involve shutting the system down after 15 minutes if no source or video sync specifically is detected on the switcher itself. Uh, after one hour if image blank or pick mute is selected. And after six hours of no activity on the user interface or touch panel. Interestingly enough, uh, the incorporation of this was kind of came to be based on a little pattern we had noticed that is something I'm sure a majority of us here, if not all of us, can relate to, where an instructor will come in and press pick mute as opposed to shutting the projector off, leaving the room. And obviously they're frustrated by the relatively long warm up and cool down times required to properly turn on off projectors. And as speculated by us, they are either trying to be courteous to the next instructor or simply could care less about concepts such as energy management or the effect wear and tear can have on the uh, overall lifespan of the equipment itself. But in either case, uh, the remainder were kind of just developed from there. Um, my colleague, Mike Deal, who everybody's mentioned, is primarily responsible for our program control system programming and with whom I work in tandem, noticed a nifty little feature on the TSW line of Crestron touch panels that allows for inactivity to be sensed via a digital flag that can be used, utilized programmatically and was inspired to create the no activity one and in, in an effort to solve the pick mute, which is 80% of the time prior to doing this. Uh, we just developed this entire mindset from there. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, all three actually. So for all three cases. Although surprisingly, or perhaps not enough, no matter to what extent we advertise it, it's hard to get instructors to re read the touch panel or the projector, so still potential for confusion. Actually, he just put in a new one. He's trying out his new, uh, uh, his new scenario. Is actually, since there's 10 minutes in between each class, okay, when an instructor shuts it down, the thing will go off, and, but the projector will still stay on for an extra 10 minutes before it shuts down. Okay, so when the instructor comes in here, you know, the next one, he doesn't have to wait because the projector, the system will look like it's off, but the projector is going to be in pick mute up there. And after 10, uh, 10 minutes, no intervention, the, the, the projector will actually shut off. But if another instructor <coughs> comes in here and hits power on, it's instantly on. So it was just, yeah, he thinks about these little weird scenarios, you know, kind of like, uh, but, you know, he comes up with pretty cool little stuff. 
and the mindset behind that was we were trying to target the amount of time in between two classes and cater to the scenario where the instructor is actually trying to be courteous. Um, but in any event, obviously, I had some personally had some concerns, um, understandably so, when we initially implemented this about the potential for false occurrences. And a lot of back and forth was spent between Mike and I trying to figure out specific deliberate times for this um, that would best implement the process across the board. If you guys have any questions, I don't want to get into that too deeply as to what exactly were the mindsets behind these, but if you have any questions at the end, I'll be glad to go into more. What is image blank? Image blank or pick mute is a oh, common okay, feature. So that's the mute. Well, yeah, we actually relay. Maybe mute or something, and then just determining how long it's it's been in that particular mode, and then it'll say, well, it's been in this for an hour. Oh, excuse me. So it'll detect that it's been in AV mute for an hour, which is you know correct a long time. That's about the right. time of of the class period. Yeah, the time so was chosen. So then it starts flashing the this thing is gonna this is gonna shut down. So, and so actually for these two auto shutoffs, it immediately starts flashing on the touch panel in the area where you would normally have the extended functionality controls in big blatant letters right away saying projector is image blank, I think is the way we word it, um, and we'll shut down in the, and you can see the countdown live the entire time, but it doesn't affect the rest, as well as instructions to the user on how to fix that situation. Same with the no source detected. The no activity will wait till about 15 minutes, I think, prior before starting to advertise that. Um, on the on the touch panel itself, so based on capacitative touch, not just the button selection. And again, that's a feature that the TSW line of Crestron touch panels allows us to implement programmatically, and since we standardized on it, it kind of helps. Those touch panels have the proximity detector on them? Uh, they don't. They don't. We, we've toyed with the idea of doing occupancy sensors. We're kind of getting to that concept. But in any event, like I said, if you guys have any questions on exact times chosen, we will uh, we can answer those later on. Um, in either case, believe it or not, we've had very few calls since implementing this about two years ago uh, that didn't involve just simply explaining to the instructor and then being completely comfortable with it. And in the handful of times it did, it really had to do with the no activity. We were initially on three hours, and so we upped that to six. And there's a couple of reasons behind why that was targeted as well. Our longest class cycle was the lab scenario, about two hours and 45. So we thought three would be adequate, but we had a few instructors that would have back-to-back -back three hours, they would come in, prepare for their scenario for the first class and didn't really need to change it on the second, and it would shut down on them potentially in 15 minutes after. But any of it, that's kind of where we went with it, and it's worked out very well. And relevant to the context of data collection and assessment, we then added custom attributes in Fusion that allowed us to not only track this, but generate reports with discrete date and time stamps of exactly when these occurred and going through R25, figuring out how much empty time there would have been in the classroom post that shutdown, as well as our standard scenario of uh, 7.30 to 8 a.m. starting and 8.30, 9.45 and weekends, we were able to develop in return on investment assessment based on these concepts as well as some very careful assumptions. This is an animal in itself for the amount of time spent. It could probably be an entire proposal, but Scott would like to introduce it briefly. Yeah, we just kind of like took the numbers. Yeah. Uh, we just kind of took the numbers that we had. I got this one. I'm good. Do you want me to pull up the slides? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. One. yeah. Yeah. Uh, we kind of really did. Uh, we tried to see what kind of return on investment since we had the shutdowns at three different times, and we kind of thought, okay, well, I'm sure everybody's got the problem of people leaving on projectors. Okay. By implementing these three different shutdowns, what kind of return on investment, what monetary money that are we saving by shutting these things down? So we just pushed the numbers and it just kind of came out. Uh, the first thing was the auto shutoff feature, and this is how we calculated. We were over a 76 day period, the fall semester of 20 semester. We don't have all the rooms on Fusion. So this is, uh, uh, <laughs> We didn't have all the rooms on Fusion, so we kind of extrapolated to, you know, we got a good data set, so we'll extrapolate it for the semester, and this is typical of a semester, so that's two semesters, two and a half semesters, say a half a semester for uh, uh, summer term. Uh, and we actually calculated all these, all the source detected, and actually since it was time and date, we got exactly when was the last class of that day. If it was on the last class of that day, that projector, it would be on all night, okay? 
uh, I'm sure you probably walk through your halls and all of a sudden see a blue screen in a classroom and it's like, oh man, somebody looked it on again. Uh, so we were looking at that. So, and then uh, what was the last class on Friday? Okay, if we didn't do it on Friday, that means that projector was on all weekend. Okay, so taking those numbers, okay, and go to the next slide. We had, we total hours saved by the auto shop was 67,000 hours, okay, uh, that were the system pretty much uh, intervened in the, uh, the, the room just to shut it off to <coughs> save energy. So we took the projector life, okay, which was, we took that number and averaged it projector life. We put 10,000 hours on the projectors. We actually called Hitachi and, and pretty much the same as your laser projectors and everything like that. After 10,000 hours, the image is gonna start degrading. Okay, so you can get good 10,000 hours out of the, uh, uh, the image chips. And I'm sure other manufacturers, I can get 20,000 out of mine or I got, you know, 4,000 hour lamps or whatever, you know. So we took the projector life, the lamp safe, you know, average cost of a lamp was $500. Uh, the labor cost, eh, what was it cost to send a student worker over there to change a lamp, okay? Uh, and minutes, the, 475 yeah. an hour. Cost per minutes. lamp. Uh, oh, no, no. Energy savings as well. Yeah. And then we got the energy saving, and that's back to him where we went to Nevada and just say, hey, exactly how much are we paying kilowatt hour? Keep and in mind, these numbers are from 2016. So we have completely changed the way. This is just the theory behind it. These numbers were from 2016. With the new fusion rollout, the new shutdowns that we have, the new projectors we have, the cheaper rates we're paying for projectors and lamps now, all these numbers have changed. So this is two-year-old data that we're showing you. We're just showing you the process and the behind the thoughts of our ROI. And this was only one semester, correct? Yeah, this yeah, was, was one semester for, just with for, 128 uh, rooms. Yeah. yeah, so these were actually the results. And, and 120 result, rooms again, 75% of our campus fusion infrastructure-wise at the time. Uh, 31,000 per semester. We approximated in the summer savings as well with that. So it would be 42,000 for a six-month period. And annually, we came up with $106,280 approximately saved, again with some careful assumptions, so quite a bit. Well, the thing now is this summer we're going to come up to, we're going to have all of them on Fusion, mm -hmm. we'll have all of our rooms, DM, digital, and uh, actually when he's been building uh, his Crestron module, he can turn on and off these uh, attributes. The okay. auto shutdown. The auto shutdown. Specifically. So awesome. what we were gonna do, and once we're into a full swing of a semester, run two weeks with it off, and then calculate and see how much lamp we save, and then turn it on and then run another two weeks on metrics, and then compare those two. And that would give us really of how much value is having those shutdowns in there. Mm -hmm. All right. So you can, I mean, as far as, you know, justifying yourselves, <laughs> you know, kind of like, hey, you know, we just did a little program change or justifying a program. So, all right. Uh, so really quick, um, we only got about 15 minutes left. We want some questions and answers, but um, one of the examples that we recently did was uh, we decommissioned VCRs, right? Everybody, I'm sure you still have people that might want to use VCRs. You might be using slide projectors now. You might be using overheads. Who knows? Where everybody's across the board, right? So in 2017, <clears throat> that's when we completed our communication to the faculty, to the campus, that we're getting rid of VCRs. So we sent out an email, sent it to the campus, said, hey, that little VCR you guys are using, next year, it's not going to be there. <clears throat> Between now and then, please reach out to the library. We gave them the library's contact info, told them who to contact. They'll digitize your stuff. They'll take care of your copyright. They'll put it on a streamer. They'll do anything they want to do. And you're not putting that tape back in that box. So when, <laughs> when they check it out, they open it up, there's a sheet of paper inside that VHS tape in the library telling them this is not going to be here in a year. Because the library was pulling out the, 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 VHS. the VHS copies. Mm -hmm. They were not even going to pump it out. If they had their own private stuff, they would copy the, they would make sure it was copyrighted and they would do it for them for free at the library. So at the end of that communication, we still technically have these VCRs in the rooms right now, but when they break, we're not replacing them. 
that was our communication. And we started buying Blu-ray players, and now we're going to strategically go and change them based on usage like this with the HDMI and VGA, you see. Well, we did that with VCR and, HD and or, uh, VHS and, and DVD as well. We went back and we did a metric like that. We saw there's only four classrooms in this building and three classrooms in that building that have VHS pushes. We'll reach out directly to that instructor and say, look it, we told you last year it was going. You're still using it. 2017, they're going to be gone. So that was one example we used. And now we're looking at HDMI and VGA. These are our last three semesters. And our percentage, as much as everybody wants to say VGA is going away, it's not. Two reasons, we think. That laptop right there still has a VGA port on it. It has an HDMI one right next to it. Their adapter is a VGA. They're used to using the VGA adapter. So there's a little bit of education. You need to go to the class, see the instructor, and say, unplug. Look at this cable. <laughs> it still works. They don't know it. It's just familiarity. Most of them are not technical <laughs> folks. That's what we're here for. So we've noticed it is that the VGA point. pushes, it's the same people. We go back through R25, we go back into Fusion, find out they're in this room. Oh, last year they were in a different building. Last year in a different building. Same instructor. They got a four-year-old, five-year-old laptop. Their departments don't buy them laptops. They got to push those things as long as possible. So we're using that metric now because we want to get rid of using VGA on the lecterns because we want to get a different DMPS. We want to go a little cheaper. Cost comes down when you're not using the bigger analog one. When you go from a 300 down to a 150, you know, you, you, you're not using VGA anymore. Cost is going to come down a little bit more. And we can do more classroom upgrades. Two minutes. So uh, we're going to jump to the last slide really quick. We basically just showed you all of this, the data and all that. We're going to be short on time, so we're going to jump right down to this. Scott, talk about the end of year. End of year. Well, again, like when I told you before, like no one really asked us, you know, to collect data or how we're doing it and stuff like that. So we took it upon ourselves to do this. And what we did also is kind of like, well, who do we give the data to? Okay. It's kind of like they're not asking for it. You send it up to them in a raw form, you know, they're not going to really read it. So actually, at the beginning for the last five years, we started putting together a year-end report just for our department. And each one of them uh, actually looks at where we've been, where we are, what we're doing, how we're going forward, the, the, the money uh, that was spent in departmental rooms and how much was spent in general purpose classrooms. Uh, And, and pretty much an overview of the whole department. So if you don't have a venue, if they're not asking for it, you know, I really suggest creating your own. You know? And this is not my product. It's, it's my department product because you know, I get information from him and he does his, the way he wants to present his section as his service that he's responsible for. Same thing with Matt in a student desk and things like that. And it kind of took a life of its own in our own department uh, to where everybody started really getting into trying to make this as accurate as possible. Or if Frank wants to highlight something, it's up to him that he can do that. So, but uh, thank you very much for our time. Another thing, it, oh, one, one last thing, we, we do have a shared drive, okay, if you email us, with all these, all of our last year's reports, our spreadsheets, our presentation, mm -hmm. and uh, several other presentations, uh, uh, just email us and we'll put you on that shared drive so you can pull down. And we actually have uh, some other stuff in there about how you can collect matrices. Uh, there's one uh, from old Joe Schuss back in the day where he did uh, uh, life cycle uh, to where you actually can calculate exactly how much does it cost to run your room. So we'll be here for today and tomorrow if you guys have any other questions. Yep, we'll feel free to reach out. I know you guys yeah. have got other groups to go to, but on that so. shared drive, is there any chance that we could the sample file of your uh, coding for the September season? Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not quite. Good, <laughs> question. <laughs> Good not question. question. Good question. Good question. I will be glad to discuss the mindset behind the algorithm and give a few collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's really not overly complicated. The main aspect to it was the amount of thought went into the specifically selected times and why we did that.
We could we could talk offline and we can push you in the right direction of how we're doing it. I mean, he's the guy to do it. I'm but sure. we're not going to give you all the keys to the castle on that one. I'm curious. <laughs> what was the determination on six hours? Um, uh, six hours had to do with the. Uh, long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So again, we had our longest class cycle was three hours, two hours and forty-five minutes to be specific. So we started at three hours. Okay. And the handful of calls we got that were more than just uh, users trying to get familiar with the concept were uh, particular instructors that had two, three hours back to back. And so they would set up for the first class, didn't need to make any changes or adjust the touch panel, get into the second set of their three hours and it would shut down on them. And, and but at the same time, we might go back to three hours because it's just a handful of instructors. Well, well, actually, we, we were kind of staying on that because recently we went into four hour classes now with film uniquely. Started doing four hours. Burns were all night, and then for the weekend, never built in auto shut up. We do it eleven o'clock. We do that too. But we were we, 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 we were still siloed, and we had all. different systems, okay. so we didn't have a lot of control over everything. We did have we did have that up in some aspects, but we are fully going this direction now. That that reason is the reason why we're doing the shutdowns now. We, and you're talking about open classrooms and things like that, where a student could come in there. You know, if you shut it down at 11 o'clock, we're a 24-hour campus, so, you know, if somebody comes in at uh, 11.05, turn it on and walk away, you're still, so that still, you know, it'll even cover those scenarios. Well, the nice thing about the mindset, exactly. So we started with the time of day shut off concept, in fact, through our previous uh, systems. And the problem is you've got clock synchronization, false potential positives, and so these, these algorithms were developed specifically to cover all scenarios. If you think about it, if you have your worst case scenario where you're on a source that ha doesn't go to sleep and they're not in pick server, still keep the right, right, but we didn't Thankfully automatically want to rely on that. <laughs> and again, with your inactivity, you're pretty much guaranteed to always cover all three. So the maximum amount of time uh, is six you hours. Wanna, uh, just take a business card, you can email.